serial killer. Those words invoke thoughts of John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, or Ted Bundy. Most of us take solace in believing that these monsters are so rare that we don't really have to worry. Sadly, there are many more of these monsters, and one in particular was more savage than can ever be imagined, except for maybe a graphic horror writer. This demented killer came before Gacy, Dahmer, and Bundy, beginning his murder spree in 1967. The late 60s, an era of hippies, peace and love, but also go-getters in college, excited by their first taste of freedom away from home. There was no shortage of these happy vibes in Ann Arbor, Michigan, especially on Eastern Michigan University's pristine campus, plush with trees and outdoor gathering spots. It was a lovely July day just north of Eastern University, in a wooded stretch, when an innocent passerby spotted something strange in the brush. The police came to investigate, and what they found was so grotesque that it shattered the town's sweet spirit, leading it straight into a two-year nightmare. Clearly violently murdered, 19-year-old Mary Flessar was the first victim, at least that we know of. Out for an evening stroll near the campus, a car sailed right in front of her and stopped. A witness detailed that he saw a male in the car. He was catcalling to her, trying to get Mary into his car. Mary was kind, as if trying to let him down easy, but before the witness knew it, the car was gone, and so was Mary. That was the last time anyone saw Mary alive. It was immediately apparent that the killer had not targeted Mary because she was some sort of enemy, or owed him money, or anything that could make the killer at least understandably motivated. This killer murdered for the sake of pure destruction of another human being. In fact, dental records were literally the only way the police could identify Mirror. The horror was in the fact that the police determined that the psycho returned to the scene of the crime several times, having moved the body and further mutilated her. This was a butcher, leaving Mary looking as if she had been mauled by a pack of wolves. But even wolves can't sever a human's feet at the ankles or arms at the elbow. Those parts were missing from her body and never found. Though the police suspected sexual assault, they could not find any conclusive evidence of that. As if Mary's murder wasn't bad enough, this next event is spine-chilling and bothersome to this day. Two days after her death, an unidentified white male with dark hair visited the receptionist at the funeral home, which housed Mary's remains. He had the gall to ask to take a photo of her body as it lay in the coffin. His unhinged explanation was that it would be a keepsake photo for Mary's parents. Of course, the receptionist firmly refused. The man silently left the funeral home, and the receptionist reported that he did not have a camera with him. Now what? Who is this madman? Where is he? The townspeople wondered and demanded answers from the police. Those particularly frightened were the college girls, being the most vulnerable. They couldn't have a chaperone every time they went out, and the college did not have enough resources to protect them at every hall, dorm, or other common area. The summer ended, then went the fall, winter, and spring. No more bodies found. Though no one loved the idea of the killer getting away with murder, most could live with that as long as the killings stopped. Locals assumed that whoever the killer was had moved on, and hopefully would never take another's life again. So a sense of relief finally began to settle, but not for long. About a year after Mary's death, on June 30, 1968, 20-year-old Joan Shell and her roommate waited outside near an Ypsilanti bus stop, hoping Shell could catch a ride hitchhiking. She had missed the bus and needed to get to Ann Arbor to visit her boyfriend. Though her roommate advised her against a ride with strangers, she wouldn't listen. Climbing into a car driven by a young white man with dark, neatly parted hair was the last time anyone saw Joan alive. Only a few days later, construction workers found Joan's body on an Ann Arbor roadside. Like Mary's injuries, Joan had many stab wounds, and it was clear that the killer executed her elsewhere and then took her near the site to dump her body. It was evident that the maniac strangled Joan, as her own miniskirt was tied too tightly around her neck for anyone to survive the pressure. At this point, fear escalated, and the police had no leads that panned out to a suspect or arrest, so they offered a reward of almost $8,000 for information leading to the killer's conviction. Months ticked by. August, September, 
all the way to March 1969. The entire time, young women and girls once again feeling imprisoned in their own dorms or local homes. The worst of it is that everyone, men and women alike, were well aware and infuriated that the murderous butcher was likely living among them in plain sight, enjoying the police's futile efforts to find him. The cops worked day and night, though, tracing the owners of all cars in Michigan that were red and black. Joan's friend at least got the color, make, and model of the maniac's car. No luck. Perhaps he was hiding the car somewhere. But then, the police got a big break. A lead, and a strong one at that. An eyewitness came forward, and what could be better than that? How about two? That was the case. Two witnesses observed Joan walking on Eastern Michigan University's campus the night before she left town. They told authorities she was with John Norman Collins, a student there majoring in elementary education. Collins looked like the man they were looking for, so he could be their man. The cops brought him in for hours of questioning. Much to their chagrin, however, Collins denied even knowing Joan, and his mom was his alibi. It was quickly and sadly determined that Collins was not the maniacal killer. The search resumed. After all, there were countless male white students attending Eastern Michigan University with brown hair, so the witness's identification could easily have been an honest mistake. The nightmare continued. A young woman shot to death and found within a 15-mile radius of the first two murders added a new level of terror to the once peaceful and safe Ann Arbor area. This time, the body looked as if the killer carefully displayed his demented work. Jane Mixer, an age 23 University of Michigan law student, was discovered on March 20th, fully clothed, with a copy of Catch-22 set by her side. Taking the kill to a new level of wickedness, the murderer dumped her body on top of a cemetery grave. This victim had her own nylons garroted around her throat, not unlike the skirt on Joan. Jane suffered two gunshots to the head. Even though Joan was not brutally beaten or otherwise mutilated like the previous women, the police would not yet find that this was a different killer. Only four days later, the discovery of yet another dead woman made it clear that the town had, yes, a serial killer on their hands. This poor victim fit the bill the first two suffered. 16-year-old Marilyn Skelton's body showed evidence of not only beatings and strangulation, but also torture, which likely occurred prior to her death. It seems the psychopath needed more depravity than before, and if he wasn't stopped, any young woman in town could be next. Poor Marilyn had a portion of her shirt stuffed down her trachea, and lacerations likely inflicted by whipping her with a leather strap. She was also likely restrained. The very worst part is that the serial killer sexually violated her by penetrating her with a tree branch. The detectives found it eight inches inside of her, at this point, there was nothing for the town to focus on but these brutal killings. The maniac walked amongst the victims, their families, friends, and the police day after day, week after week, undetected. He could get himself a soda or catch a movie, and no one was the wiser that they were amid pure evil itself. Girls and women began carrying knives and mace in record numbers, and hitchhiking stopped. Due to public outcry, the police increased their offer for information to $42,000 which would be close to $350,000 today. So, who would the killer trick, kidnap, and murder next? That was the only question on everyone's minds. Horribly, it was only a month before the question would be answered. On April 16, 1969, Don Basom was found beside a desolate road in Ypsilanti, a small town just outside of Ann Arbor. Don had been strangled and stabbed to death with a focus on her sexual organs. Ironically, Don had smartly had a male friend escort her on her walk home the night before she was taken, both knowing the danger looming in the area. But the gentleman should have walked her all the way up to her home. Believing she would be safe for a short final stretch, they had parted ways. The detectives found parts of Don's clothing leading to a farmhouse only 100 yards from her body, so they did a thorough investigation of the abandoned home, which led them to a new and pivotal lead. This was definitely a home frequented by the killer, as a scrap of cloth from Don's clothing and an earring belonging to Marilyn were both found in the basement of the home. 13-year-old Don Basin was last seen walking along these railroad tracks, taking a shortcut home. She never made it. Don was a normal 13-year-old child, lived in this white frame home. He took her to that abandoned house out on 
LaForge Road. She was in the basement of that house. And they found glass in her elbows and knees. She had gotten out of there and got across the yard to the back toward the barn, and that's where she was attacked and murdered. The butcher behind the murders was watching. Only a few weeks later, when the farmhouse was not crawling with police, an act of arson burned down the whole home. Spine chilling was the fact that upon approaching the home, five clipped lilacs were set up in an even row on the driveway. Five flowers, five murders. The killer was messing with the police, and the police were at a loss. Each murdered, violated, mutilated body found sunk the town deeper and deeper into the abyss of fear. The pressure on law enforcement to catch this madman was through the roof. All the while, the murderer could watch the police leads go nowhere, giving him the chance to kill another day. So who is the culprit? Would his identity ever be revealed? Or was this going to be like the Zodiac Killer, who got away with all of his murders? The town prayed not. Hundreds of tips came in. The community even employed the help of a self-proclaimed psychic. At that point, any type of help was welcome. Despite running down every tip and every vision from the psychic, the butcher was still on the loose. On June 8, 1969, 21-year-old Alice Kalem was found murdered. And only one month later, EMU student Karen Bynaman's nude beaten body was found in a gully. Parts of her body were skinned and others burned, this time more sexual assault. Karen Sue Bynaman came into this wig shop on Washtenaw Avenue in downtown Ipsy. She said, I've just done two things that I haven't done in my life. I'm buying a wig and I accepted a ride on a motorcycle with a stranger. Karen Bynaman took the last ride of her life. The killer raped her. Although a tragedy without question, the crime scene provided a new hope of catching the maniac. The police knew he liked to return to the scenes and further defile the bodies so they kept it under wraps that a body had even been discovered. They would create a trap. They replaced Karen's body with a clothing mannequin and made the body look as traumatized as Karen's. When night fell, undercover officers watched the surrounding area. It rained cats and dogs, but within only a few hours, one of the cops spotted a man running away from the gully. The rain must have prevented them from spotting his arrival. Immediately, the fortunate cop radioed the officers in the runner's path, but it was all futile. The rain had soaked the radio, rendering it inoperable. The whole plan failed, and the killer was once again in the wind. Eventually, a month later, the serial killer was caught. To the town's surprise, it turned out to be someone they let slip through their fingers. The Eastern Michigan University student previously questioned, John Norman Collins. Remember him? The one whose mother was his alibi. Well, the police never followed up on the alibi. They made the grave mistake of taking young Collins at his word. Part of the reason could have been that his uncle, a family man who lived in Ypsilanti, was a state police sergeant, lending Collins some perceived credibility. Collins became later known as the Ypsilanti Ripper, or the co-ed Michigan murderer. What's shocking is that he was only arrested and convicted for his final murder. There was not enough evidence to convict him of the other murders. The difference between his first murders and his last of Karen Bynaman is that there were several eyewitnesses who saw him with Karen immediately before she went missing. They saw his face, they knew his name, and they knew he drove off with her on a motorcycle, the exact kind owned by Collins. On top of that, he got sloppy, maybe too confident. While his police sergeant uncle was out of town with his family, Collins was given the task of feeding their family dog, so Collins was the only person with access to the house for several days, the same days that Karen was kidnapped and murdered. It did not take long for the sergeant and his wife to notice things like paint marks on the basement floor additional items in their home, including laundry detergent, black spray paint, and a bottle of ammonia, none of which belonged to them. After some investigation by the police, the authorities had the evidence they so desperately needed to get the Ypsilanti Ripper off the streets. Of course, the law-abiding uncle was devastated, but he still assisted the police. Ironically, the substance the Ripper spray painted over was varnish, but he missed some actual bloodstains, ones the police found matched the blood type of Karen. They also found strands of Karen's hair in the basement. And finally, the most disturbing evidence was the testimony of a neighbor who described muffled female screams coming from the sergeant's home on the evening of Karen's disappearance. John Norman Collins rented a room on the second floor of this building. Yep, this is where he lived. Right across the street, over there, that's where victim number two, Joan Shell, lived. A full criminal trial took place because Collins pled not guilty, like a true sociopath but the evidence was indisputable. 
On August 19, 1970, the jury found the Ripper guilty of first-degree murder against Karen Vineman. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. As to the murder of Miss Mixer, it was determined that she was not killed by Collins, and another individual was eventually arrested for her murder. If you recall, she was the one that was not mutilated like those in the wake of the Ripper's killings. To this day, now age 76, Collins maintains that he never even knew Karen and did not kill anyone. The Ypsilanti Ripper lives in a world of delusion and behind bars of steel, and it seems he will until he meets his maker.